Hey, we've done it. We've done it, everyone. Welcome, one and all, to the Fox Akimbo 100 video spectacular. Get comfy, grab a beer or a fizzy drink or some juice, and let's talk about some obscure mysteries. We've done this rugmarole before, but let me just jump back into the gauntlet once again. Because a lot of these, if not all of them, you likely would have never heard of. This is not clickbait. I guarantee you right now, you will not know 90% of the obscure mysteries on this list. So we're going to start off obscure and as the video goes on, it's going to get obscurer. Now, let it be known that this iceberg is huge. It has over 400 entries, so I won't be able to cover them all in this video. I'm only actually covering the top two tiers and there's about like a hundred of them as it is. I'll cover a few if there's demand. I'll cover the rest. Either way, let's get into it because I'm so excited. I've got my Audi quality carver right here. I mean, it's a hundred video spectacular. Let's go. I'm not usually big on- oh, actually, no. No, that's not good. So what could start us off for today's deep journey down the iceberg? It is none other than machine elves. What's that? you not heard of them before. I mean, maybe a few of you have. But in case you haven't, machine elves are what apparently a lot of people see when they're taking DMT. So the few druggies in this video that have taken DMT, have you seen them? They can be described as having towering slender bodies cloaked in what can only be described as alien skin. Now, it would just be one thing if one or two people saw them, but apparently machine elves, otherwise known as DMT elves, are seen by a lot of people who take the drug. They're also known by the name Spirit Molecule. Now, sightings of these elves often vary, but it tends to be said that they include various different body parts of people that they know jumbled in unique patterns. This is the main reason why DMT elves are thought to be a thing. Researchers say that you cannot imagine something that you haven't already seen. Therefore, DMT elves are a combination, a mishmash of things you already know brought into your high state. But even with that being said, this theory is unconfirmed. These things may exist with within us, within our psyche. Or they might even exist outside of us, something that we can't see until we're in the right mindset to do so. One thing can be said for sure though, the human psyche is an enigmatic beast and we are by no means anywhere near fully capable of understanding it at this point. This is the second entry I have for you guys today, so let me drop some needed niche knowledge. The hypothesis of cosmic censorship states that whenever a body collapses so completely as to result in the formation of a singularity, a black hole will be formed so that the singularity will be hidden behind the horizon and thus completely unobservable for everyone outside the black hole. Now that is a lot of science. And I believe that this is in fact Einstein level of science, so apologies, I have no idea what this is going on about. Here's the Wikipedia page for you nerds, we're moving on. That's the only entry that I have today that's completely stumped me. I have no clue what they're on about there. The Silent Man though is a topic I can talk on. He lives in Swansea, Wales. So shout out to all the Welsh people watching this video. I thank you for your support. So the deal with the Silent Man is that he's been blocking traffic for years now and nobody knows the reason why, mostly because he doesn't want to tell you. So what do we know about the Silent Man? Well, we know he's 51. We know that his name is David Hampson, and we know that he blocks the road in the same spot outside Swansea Police Station and has done it for seven years now. But even under the threat of legal action, he's always kept an informal vow of silence. He does speak, let it be known, he's not mute. He's actually spoken to officers before. Apparently he isn't very polite. Still, the reason why he blocks traffic in Wales was, is, and potentially will be for a long time a mystery. We just haven't gotten to the bottom of it. The only person who do knows is the silent man. So I want to combine the next two entries. I said I would stop doing cryptids, but I have some on the iceberg today, so we're just gonna cover them. Crawlers are the first one, and they are a commonly seen cryptid with pale skin, long limbs, and a tall, thin body. They're generally seen to be about eight feet tall standing, and there are some stories of this creature throughout America. Convenient, it's always America. So crazy how all of these random creatures always just so happen to end up in the USA, but I'll hold my reservation for now. Apparently, these crawlers have inspired modern culture such as Until Dawn's Wendigo, The Rake, and Slender Man. This is one of the most popular cryptids with many people all over the United States saying that they have seen them at the dead of night. But mysteriously, nobody has ever caught footage of them. This is where I want to get into the second part of this entry, which is cameras not working around paranormal entities. It's very convenient that cameras never seem to work around paranormal entities. 
Could it be a hoax? Or could it be that these paranormal entities have some sort of electromagnetic fields that will mess with the camera? I'll let you be the judge of that. Every year, thousands come out sharing tales of the terrible, but cameras never capture the creatures. Are they correct? I'm just one man, how could I say? Consequently, if you do have creepy cryptic chronicles, please let me know down below. The liver is one of our most important organs and a fundamental part of our body's overall regulation. It is paramount to keep your liver healthy and limit overindulgence. Oh. <laughs> that was not worth the joke. Drink responsibly. And for centuries, people have thought you basically only have one shot with your liver. However, there's a little conspiracy theory out there called liver flushing, which is basically just another word for liver detoxes. And it might just blow this all out of the water. If true, you could replenish your liver and keep it healthy, but scientists say that detoxes may actually harm your liver. Studies have found that liver injuries from herbal and dietary supplements are on the rise. Green tea extract, for example, can cause damage like that from hepatitis. And coffee enemas involved in some regimens can lead to infectious and electrolyte problems that might be deadly. Do not give yourself a coffee enema. Don't do it. The science is out on liver flushing. Maybe wait until we get confirmation before you give yourself an at-home coffee enema. So this video isn't meant to be crazy conspiracy theories, but there are a few of them in here. One of which is our next subject, that the Roman Empire never existed. It's a recent theory, the article linked only dates back to December 2021. And yeah, this rather strange claim comes courtesy of TikTok history enthusiast at Mummillennial, whose theories have been proven to be somewhat divisive. The idea is that Rome was in fact a hoax perpetrated by the Spanish Inquisition. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that this is complete and utter hogwash before this becomes the next Flat Earth. I can't be bothered to go with another Flat Earth. This is solved. You're wrong. I don't care. Humanoid cryptids, or cryptids that appear to be human, are some of the only ones that I actually like. They're creepy, they're cool, and the Fleshgate happens to be one of them. Tales of these strange beings have started to surface throughout all parts of the world, but they're especially common in areas near national parks in, you guessed it, the United States. So a flesh gate is a creature that mimics voices and appearances of people in the woods, often with the intent of luring them away. Those who have seen flesh gates in their natural appearance claim that they're extremely tall, thin, grey beings with long claws and no hair. Their sole intent is to kill, but apparently reports claim that you can use some white ash to defend yourself. Apparently they don't like it. If you hear whistling in the woods at the dead of night when no one else is around, you have to get out of there. Jetpack Man is an unknown personal object who was spotted flying above Los Angeles, California at least five times between 2020 and 2021. Multiple airplane pilots have reported seeing Jetpack Man at altitudes around 5,000 feet. It is unknown whether each sighting is the same person or whether it might just be a drone designed to look like a person with a jetpack. Neither jetpacks nor large drones are commonly flown at that altitude or at that distance from land, and there have been no sightings of a takeoff or landing. It's been theorized by the FBI and the FAA that Jetpack Man is actually a balloon. However, as of early 2022, we can't be certain. All we know is that Jetpack Man, if he is real, has been keeping it quiet for the past few months. The Nine Unknown is a 1923 novel by Talbot Mundy. Originally serialized in Adventure Magazine, it concerns the Nine Unknown Men, a secret society founded by the Mauryan Emperor in around 270 BC to preserve and develop knowledge that would be dangerous to humanity if it fell into the wrong hands. The Nine Unknown Men were entrusted in guarding nine books of secret knowledge. The concept of the Nine Unknown Men was further popularized in Louis Puel's and Jacques Bergier's 1960 book, The Morning of the Magicians. They claimed that the Nine Unknown were real and had been founded by the Indian Emperor. They also claimed that Pope Sylvester II had met them, and that 19th century French colonial administrator and writer Louis Jacouliot insisted on their existence. The Nine Unknown were also the final dedicatees mentioned in the dedication of the first edition of Anton Lavallee's Satanic Bible in 1969. So just who were these nine men? <laughs> well, as the name suggests, they are unknown unknown, unsolved, obscure mysteries. If they existed, if, who were they, what did they know, and why was it them? This is something that may be lost to history forever. 
Greek fire. This is actually the first one I know. I've covered this in a video before. It was at the very bottom of my historical mysteries iceberg, and right here, it's kind of at the top of this iceberg, which just goes to show you how obscure this stuff is. So Greek fire is actually ancient technology that we simply cannot replicate today because we don't know how. The secret to Greek fire died out hundreds of years ago. To my knowledge, this is completely real. The unsolved part is how do we make it? But the story goes that it consisted of a pipe mounted to Byzantine ships that sprayed a thick gel-like fire at the enemies. Dozens of relatively reliable sources attest to its existence, but by the 1300s, all accounts had stopped. The main reason is that it's thought that the resource, whatever they used to create Greek fire, had been run out of the ground. It was non-renewable and it just ran out. Whether it be that or something else, the 1300s was the last time we heard of it, and 700 years later, we still have no clue how they made this technology. The Appalachian region of the United States is home to many of the most well-known cryptids including Mothman, the Appalachian Chubacabra, the Pennsylvanian White Bigfoot, and many others, just to name a few. To that list, we may add more recent reported sightings of what's referred to as the Not Deer. Not Deer are described to look like deer, as the name might suggest, but there's something wrong with them. Such as having forward-facing eyes of a predator, a neck that's too long, or a head that's misshapen, and so on and so forth. Like a deer, but not. Alleged sightings of the deer have been reported mostly within Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Connecticut, with some reported sightings being as far away as Texas, and even Norway particularly enough. Have you ever seen a not deer or an animal that you can't really describe or put a name to, something creepy or a cryptid? Let me know if you have. At 4.01 a.m. on the 25th of June 2007, there was a update to the Chris Benoit Wikipedia page saying that he would be replaced by Johnny Nitro for the upcoming ECW World Championship match at Vengeance. I've spoken about the tragedy of Chris Benoit before, but I have never spoken about this specific event. The knowledge that he was missing from the match was already known, I believe, but the knowledge that apparently it had been due to a stabbing of his wife Nancy was not added until 4.01 a.m. Here's the thing though. The police would not find the bodies until 2.30 p.m. the same day. This is the Chris Benoit premonition, because either the person who posted this knew something, or this was an absolutely incredible coincidence. The IP address of the person who posted this was traced to Stamford, Connecticut, which is also where the headquarters of the WWE is. After an investigation by the police, they concluded the poster had nothing to do with it, but coincidence or not, this was creepy. And we don't know what came over the poster's mind when he decided to post something like that. That's just sick. Even if it was just a coincidence, why would you post something like that? absolute idiot, first of all. But the fact that it was real is is such a incredible coincidence and it landed him in hot water because of course he would think that he had something to do with it. Perhaps he knew something that he never let on. The Poe Toaster, another entry that I've covered very deep down in other icebergs. So Edgar Allan Poe is one of the greatest literary geniuses in human history, but he also kind of created goths, so I'll definitely deduct some points there. We're still dealing with that today, come on man. His cause of death is still uncertain, but he died on October 7th, 1849. Starting at some point in the 1930s, every year on Edgar Allan Poe's birthday, January 19th, somebody, a shadowy figure dressed in black with a wide brimmed hat and white scarf, would pour himself a glass of cognac and raise a toast to Poe's memories and then vanish into the night, not to be seen again, leaving three roses in a distinctive arrangement and the unfinished bottle of cognac. This is theorized to be until the original toaster's death in 1998, after which the tradition was passed onto the toaster's son. In 2010, there was no visit by the toaster, nor has he appeared since, signaling an end to the 75 year tradition. Who was the toaster and why did he do it? What did Edgar Allan Poe mean to him? What did the roses or the cognac symbolize? If anything, well, you'd have to find the anonymous man and ask him for yourself, but unfortunately that is no longer an option. Help me, Susie is dying. This is a very fascinating story and has many, many accounts. So back in the 70s and even the early 80s in the UK, there was a lot of people spreading around a rumor about a spooky number that you could call. Apparently it had a lot of twos and threes in it. That's what everyone 
seems to be able to remember. This was a very childhood kind of thing. It would mostly be children. I don't think anyone over the age of like 14 would be calling it up. It was the 1970s and 80s Bloody Mary, I guess. When you called it, apparently a woman in a very monotone voice would answer saying, help me, Susie's dying. Apparently, sometimes she would say, help me, help me. Was this a tall tale told by Tykes, or could it be a true tale told by truth tellers? Till today, the truth is told to be debatable at best. The Dyatlov Pass incident was an event in which nine Russian hikers died in the northern Ural Mountains between the 1st and 2nd of February 1959 in very uncertain circumstances. The experienced trekking group from the Ural Polytechnic Institute was led by Igor Dyatlov. They had established a camp, but during the night something caused them to cut their way out of their tent and flee the campsite while inadequately dressed for the heavy snowfall and sub-zero temperatures. After the group's bodies were discovered, an investigation by Soviet authorities determined that six had died from hypothermia, while three had been killed by physical trauma. One victim had major skull damage, two of them had severe chest trauma, and another had a small crack in their skull. Four of the bodies were found lying in running water in a creek, and three of these had soft tissue damage to the head and face. Two of the bodies were missing their eyes, one was missing their tongue, and one was missing its eyebrows. The investigation concluded that a compelling natural force had caused these deaths, and theories had ranged from animal attacks to avalanches, but the difference in damage to these bodies leaves me to question these theories. No matter what theory you want to go for, there is not a single answer that works perfectly for any of them. And I really do doubt that it was a mixture, it couldn't have been like an avalanche and then some sort of animal went to attack them also, it would have just been one thing and it's really, really hard to know what. To this day, we have ideas, but I really don't think there's been any concrete breakthroughs, even if they might have settled on the fact that this was just an avalanche. I, I don't think so. This was a nice little rundown, but of course I can't explain it all in two minutes. There's so much stuff here. So if you're interested, do go follow up this video with some more research after you finish it, of course. Ads reading your minds. So I think that cookies have definitely been at the forefront of privacy discussions over the past few years. There's always a point of interest when you're talking about a product and then a couple of minutes later or a couple of hours, you get that exact same product recommended to you on your Amazon or just in your YouTube ads. It's pretty crazy. I definitely think my phones are listening to me, for sure, absolutely. But if you're like me, you might have had one or two instances where you don't even say what you're thinking of, you're thinking of it, and you still get recommended that exact Thing. Could it be a coincidence or has there been some sort of technology to read our minds? Humans, I'll be honest, are actually quite predictable. It's definitely a chance that they just kind of know what you might want based on your recent habits. I remember there's a famous case of when Target knew a teenage girl was pregnant before her own dad did, which is incredible. They knew based on what she was looking at that she was pregnant and the dad came in like, why are you saying my daughter's pregnant? Turns out she was. Humans are easily predictable, but the algorithms that we use are still a mystery to the general public. So definitely an unknown and unsolved mystery here. Who knows? Who knows? What do you think? I, I'd be very interested to hear your answer. Do let me know in the comments. What if I were to tell you that your virtual world, the internet, and essentially everything on it is dead and has been for a long, long time. Your whole online reality is actually a work of fiction. The chances are you watching this, the comments on this video, the subscribers in my sub box, the members of my Discord, the followers of me on Instagram and Twitter, do all those by the way if you are human, are all bots. They're all fake, they are all computer generated, AI. Welcome to the dead internet theory. Essentially, the premise of the dead internet theory is that the web is not as democratized as we might think, and trends, memes, and all the rest are actually hand chosen by AI and not humans. AI chose Squid Game to be a massive hit, or Baby Shark to be the most popular video on YouTube, probably just to piss us off. The theory is that we have no power in what trends, what becomes popular, who rises to the top, and who will fail forever. Apparently this happened around post 2016, so since 2016 the internet has been dead and has just been a wasteland filled with bots and not really humans, at least the amount of bots would severely outweigh the humans, my lights just turned off there. So next up we have the Padmana 
Baswami Temple Treasure. Uh, apologies for the pronunciation, I probably botched it awfully. This is a collection of valuable objects including gold thrones, crowns, coins, statues and ornaments, as well as diamonds and other precious stones. The temple management authorities were aware of the existence of at least six vaults known as A, B, C, D, E and F. Five of these were opened in 2011, every single one except for Vault B. People tried to open B, they opened a metal grill door to Vault B, and they discovered that a sturdy wooden door was just behind it. They opened this door as well and encountered a third door made of iron which was jammed shut. Clearly someone did not want anyone finding out what was behind Vault B. The observers tried to force their way in, but they did fail in the end. For this reason, they decided to hire a professional locksmith to open or remove the door gently. However, just before the locksmith came, the Indian royal family got an injunction from the Supreme Court against opening Vault B. It has since been confirmed that the Supreme Court refused to give permissions to open the vault as it was an issue involving religious sentiments. The vault door is last thought to have been opened in the 1880s and might never be opened at all ever again. What secrets, treasures and riches lies behind a door that we came oh so close to opening? We might never find out. Whatever lies behind Vault B, whether it be some sort of religious, sentimental item or, or just more riches and gold, we might not know. We might never know. Whatever it is, that's kind of a cool mystery. If you like strange disappearances, this obscure next entry is for you. The MV Joyita was an American merchant vessel from which 25 passengers, its crew and its cargo, mysteriously disappeared in the South Pacific in October 1955. The ship was found adrift with no one on board and it had been damaged severely with corroded pipes and a radio which, while functional, only had a range of about 2 miles or 3.2 kilometers because of faulty wiring. However, it has to be said that due to the extreme buoyancy of the ship, it made sinking nearly impossible. And I know we've heard that before, you know, unsinkable ship and it sinks. This one would be, you know, 50, 60 years later from the Titanic. Sinking this ship would have been near impossible. Investigators were perplexed as to why the crew did not stay on board and wait for help. And in the years since, nobody has been found in the search for them. Now, the captain of the ship would have known the MV Joyita would have been nearly unsinkable, leading theorists to assume that either the captain was injured or incapacitated. Bloodstained bandages were found aboard. Could they have been his? What happened to the captain? There's also theories that the ship might have passed Japanese fishing boats and the people aboard might have seen something they weren't meant to. Or it was hijacked by pirates and people aboard were murdered and the cargo was seized. Whatever happened to the MV Joyita on that fateful day almost 70 years ago, as the title suggests, this is an obscure and unsolved mystery. The fern flower is a magical plant in Baltic mythology. Shout out to all of the Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians that might be watching this video, all six of you, shout out to you guys. According to the myth, the flower blooms for a very short time on the eve of the summer solstice and the flower brings fortune to the person who finds it. In various versions of the tale, the fern flower brings luck wealth and the ability to actually understand animal speech. However, the flower is closely guarded by evil spirits and anyone who finds the flower will have access to earthly riches. Now compared to most cryptids or obscure mythology, which is just completely crazy and wacky, a supernatural flower is something that I can get down with a little bit more here. There have been no confirmed sightings of the flower ever, but of course there would not be. Someone who found the flower would not want to, I guess, expose that they did find it. Of course they wouldn't want to give the location of the fern flower away as to not have their power grasped from their clutches. Very interesting in my humble opinion. Long story short, the severed feet phenomena is referring to the fact that since 2007, at least 20 severed human feet have been found on the coast of the Salish Sea in British Columbia, Canada. Shout out to all the Canadians watching this video. So here's the question. Why? Why severed human feet? Just, just feet, not hands, not legs, not heads just feet. Most of the feet washed up are from different people. As weird as it sounds, having two severed feet get washed up is less weird than if just one does. It's thought that the vast majority of the people whose feet these belong to had committed suicide. There is rarely foul play theorised and most of them have been identified, but between 2007 and 2008 specifically, there were seven severed feet found in a relatively short distance to one another. Was it a major coincidence or was there something else at play? If you have any ideas, 
ideas, do let me know. I would be very interested to hear them. The Mud Flood Theory. So in short, the theory is that there was some sort of history wipe or reset, and there was some kind of mud flood catastrophe around the 1850s, causing worldwide mud accumulation, covering a large portion of buildings and churches, etc. And historical evidence was mostly removed from our libraries and education systems because of some far-fetched reasons. I really don't want to linger on this one. Whack job conspiracy theory, I'm going to move on. Speaking of whack job conspiracies, our next entry is that Saturn the planet has an evil influence on the Earth. There's a reason why Saturn and Satan have such similar names, isn't there? Oh yeah, we, we caught him on that one. As if if Satan wanted to have some sort of alias, you know, of course he'd go for Saturn, just change up his name just a little bit. He wouldn't go for something like Steve. I don't want to sound too harsh here, but if you think that Saturn has an evil influence on the Earth, just grow up. I'm about to drop some literary history on you here. Back in 2005, Christopher Knight and Alan Butlin created a novel pondering one of life's most unthought questions, who built the moon? Their thought process was that if life only existed on Earth because of the moon being the exact right size distance and every other variable you want to say, it must therefore not be a natural object and must have been created. In Who Built the Moon, they come up with ideas of who could have built the moon and why. Again, I'm going to assume that these guys are scientists, maybe disgraced scientists, and they don't just say God built the moon, because that would just be three words in the book. God built it. Done. Are we just intergalactic monkeys dancing for our supreme alien overlords? I will leave it up to you if the moon is artificially made or not. This one is kind of messed up just based on how recent it is, but after the event took place, people instantly had conspiracy theories. I'm talking about Astro World. This was Travis Scott's concert, which ended up with 10 deaths, and some people thought that this was some sort of sacrifice. They falsely were saying that Travis Scott and Drake were born 66 months and 6 days apart, and they were saying all kinds of false or at least arguable information. Of course, conspiracy theories always have to be taken with a pinch of salt, but if you're one of those people that subscribe to the uh, people at the top, celebrities, overlords or whatever, that are pulling the strings on us normal commoners or whatever, you might believe that something strange was afoot here. I personally do not. Sun Paku Eyes. The iceberg here linked me to the Wikipedia page describing them, and I'm going to have to interpret what the mystery here is. I think I've got it, but I'm not 100% sure. So in Japan, there is a term Sun Paku Eyes, which refers to the people who have whites at the bottom of their eyes on show, just underneath the iris. It's for this reason that it's sometimes referred to as third white, because you have whites on the left, to the right and underneath. Sometimes it's above, but usually it's underneath. So in Japanese face reading, various elements of the face can tell someone about your personality, abilities, or experiences, very similar to palm reading. I think everyone's aware of that. You can tell something about someone's life just based on the lines on their palm. Japanese do it a bit differently. They'll tell you something about you based on your face. What are your eyebrows like? How is your lip shaped, your chin? everything. Unfortunately for people with Sampaku eyes, their traits tend to be very negative. And it's thought these people are more likely to have violent outbursts, poor self-control, they're highly suspicious, and so on and so forth. So I'll take it to you, the viewer. What do you think about this? Do you think that you could judge someone based on their facial features? Do you think that because someone has small ears or a large nose or they have very wide lips, do you think that you would be able to guess something based on their personality or traits? They say that the eyes are the window to the soul. Could this statement be more true than we give it credit for? Stanislav Zukowski, the creator of Bent Classicism. He is also known for developing the pseudoscientific historical theory of Zermatism, posting that all human culture was derived from Easter Island and that mankind was locked in some sort of eternal struggle with the sons of the Yeti, the offspring of Yeti and humans. To get this theory out to the world, he created Behold the Protong in 1980, and this was the culmination of 40 years of work. He began working on it in 1940, and it contains 40,000 illustrations and 25,000 pages. His book does not have much scientific method, even if a few people believe it here or there. I'm going to say that this is not unsolved. If it means much to you, crazy conspiracy theories are quite relaxed from now on. There's not too many of them left. The Stick Man. This is a strange story I'm so stirred to share. So this is based on a Reddit post by Farmers Are Ninjas, and it was actually posted only three months ago, gaining just over nine. 900 upvotes. He says that there is an old man that lives near him, at least in his 80s, who each day spends hours on his lawn meticulously arranging sticks in a specific pattern. The user asked the stick man why he did this, and he simply responded with, 
It is, it just is. He also claimed that someone told him that his land was built on an ancient Indian burial ground, so the chances might be that this has something to do with it. Even more mysteriously, he said that in 2022 he would not be there. So there's so many questions that we have for this. A. Was this built on an ancient burial ground? B. If it's not, or even if it was, who told him? C. Why won't he be there in 2022? Is he dying? Is he going to be part of some sort of sacrifice or something like that? It's really hard to tell. Also, why? Again, why is he using these sticks? Why is he arranging them in the patterns that he does? Apparently, it's always different. So, why? I mean, it, it's very, very enigmatic to me. It's just a mystery. It's an obscure mystery. Again, only 900 upvotes. And I just enjoy this kind of stuff. I don't know. Speaking of the stick man, he is apparently very, very skinny, similar to that of a stick man. I don't think that has anything to do with anything, but I saw it in the Reddit post, so I thought I'd mention. What do you think? Do you have any theories about the stick man? If so, I would love to hear them. In 1971, Max Gunther wrote a book titled Wall Street and Witchcraft an investigation into extreme and unusual investment techniques. And I haven't read the book, unfortunately, but here is a little synopsis. Gunther asked the question that since modern Wall Street has been a thing, the bankers have always won. The fat cats on Wall Street have been picking winners and harvesting huge profits with uncanny success. Max Gunther shares some stories of how even some of the various people from highly successful and prosperous backgrounds utilize physics, astrology, magic, and other unconventional means for target results. For people into mythology and witchcraft who want to make a bit of bank, this book might be for you. Do the tycoons on Wall Street know something that we don't? Capitalists, communists, socialists, witches, wizards and warlocks, be sure to don on the boxing gloves and have at it in the comments below. Let me know what you think. The golden cigarette incident comes from John Keel's The Cosmic Question, where the author collects examples of peculiar cigarettes smoked by men in black entities. Now, in this book, he describes a case in Italy, 1952, where a UFO witness was threatened by a strange man with apparently a golden cigarette. However, the only online source I could find translated as a weird cigarette with a glided mark on the side, and there is no mention of it being gold, so who really knows? I'm kind of stumped on this one a little bit. <sighs> Once again, let's talk about cryptids. I know you guys love them. So there is a theory that most cryptids went extinct in the early 20th century, and it's actually made me rethink how I have looked at cryptids a little bit. Take the Minhokau, for example. I think that's how you pronounce its name, at least. It was first reported back in the 1840s and hasn't been seen since the turn of the 20th century. The Earth is currently going through its sixth mass extinction, and some people think that we're losing upwards of 150 species a day. Could it be that at some point in time before cameras were able to record some of the species that we might refer to as cryptids, they just went extinct because they were far too dangerous or humans didn't like them or they just ran out of road. Similar to the thylacine, could the minocow have been hunted to death or something? It is actually possible. Did human advancement come at the cost of the demise of their species? There is a chance for it. I think that this might be my favourite theory about cryptids, that they might have existed at one point, but now they don't. And even when they did exist, they were low on number. Just something for you to think about. The electric universe theory sounds so much cooler than it actually is. But some people say that electric currents that flow along plasma filaments shape and power galaxies. The currents stream into stars, powering them like fluorescent bulbs. They induce the birth of planets. The theory is that craters on those planets come from electrical arcs like lightning bolts that sear the surfaces. This theory therefore states that black holes do not exist, the Big Bang never happened, and all of Einstein's theories were incredibly wrong. Do we know enough about the universe to disprove it? I mean, I would think so, but I'm not an expert. Either way, as I said earlier, I really don't want to dwell on theories for too long. The Putney Bridge Jogger. This is an unsolved case that might be a bit different to what you're used to on iceberg charts. Surprisingly, I hadn't heard this on the news, but back in 2018, there was a man jogging on Putney Bridge and he seemed to bump into a woman, pushing her over almost into the incoming path of a bus. Fortunately, in what can only be described as an act of absolute heroism, the bus driver swerved out of the way and the woman lived. But on another day, that woman really could have died. So you bump into someone whilst jogging on the street. 
what do you do? You apologize next, right? This man did not. This man just jogged on without a care in the world. It almost looks like he did it on purpose. The police then searched for him. High and low, the Metropolitan Police looked at over 50 people of interest, but the man's identity has never been confirmed. He never faced justice for his recklessness. To this day, the Putney Bridge jogger is out there somewhere, having been given a second lease on life because of his identity never being confirmed. I'm not too sure how long stories of alien abductions have been going around for, but the story of the 1593 transported soldier must be one of the earlier ones out there. Legend has it that a soldier of the Spanish Empire, some have since named him Gil Perez, was mysteriously transported from the Philippines to Mexico City. The soldier's claims to have come from the Philippines was initially disbelieved by the Mexicans, until his account of the assassination of Gomez Perez das Marinas was corroborated months later by the passengers of a ship who had crossed the Pacific Ocean with the news. At the time, he had been arrested for being a deserter and a suspected servant of the devil, but he was soon freed after someone had seen him in the Philippines after the death of the governor. Very convenient. So what happened to him? Did he transport there himself, or was he abducted by aliens like he claims? Was he lying? Probably, but I will let you be the judge of that. The death of Geoffrey de Rosier. I'm sure that will be a name that you have never heard of, but let me tell you his story. I hope that we're all a little bit familiar with curses, especially dying curses, because they are the most fun. So Geoffrey de Rosier cursed a mirror as he was taking his final breaths back in 1936. De Rosier was only 38 at the time. He told his wardmate that he was with that he would not be able to pick up a mirror from the table. The mirror, apparently tossed at random onto the steel table, froze solidly to the table and the efforts of his wardmates, of the hospital attendants and Dr. F.J. Maloney to remove it were useless for more than 24 hours. Then Miss Adeline Nomph, a nurse from the operating room, using an ice pick with force, pried it up. Unlike many spooky stories, this is one that I'm actually quite interested in because a lot of the staff that were working at the hospital did not believe in the supernatural whatsoever. It's one thing when you go out with a bunch of Bigfoot mates and you find him eventually because they all believe in it, but the doctors that were working there were not superstitious in the slightest, and so this really did bug them. Even when Dogia's physician was asked if he thought that the answer was a supernatural one, he asked, do I look superstitious to you? He had no clue how it happened. A very interesting one for sure. Our next entry is a little bit sadder though. This is the tale of Kathy Hobbs. Her parents divorced when she was eight, and when she was in middle school, a friend of hers died from a heart condition. Due to this, or perhaps a reason more unknown, Kathy was certain that she would never live to see her 16th birthday. She and her family moved to a residential apartment complex in Las Vegas in order to help her get her mind off of her fears, and over the next few years she lived a relatively normal life. But her 16th birthday came and went, and to Kathy's surprise, she actually did live. However, in the late hours of the 23rd of July 1987, she told her mum that she wanted to take a quick trip to the nearby supermarket to purchase a book a request that her mother granted. Kathy Hobbs would never be seen alive again, with her mother waking up the next day to find her empty bed. Evidence shows that she made it to the store and she bought the book, but authorities did not know where she went from there. Now, this case has essentially been solved. It's thought that serial killer Michael Lockhart was the murderer, and he was actually executed in 1997. There was a mysterious caller who said he saw two men dragging Kathy into the car, one of whom's name was allegedly Robbie. So there might have been an accomplice in her abduction that was never caught. We don't know for sure this anonymous tip could have just been fake. To add to that theory, the license plate of the car that the person said she was dragged into was not recognised by the authorities. And if the license plate didn't exist, maybe this mysterious person, Robbie, also did not. Still, if this anonymous caller was telling the truth, there might be a serial killer walking among us. Fingers crossed it was only Michael and the family can finally gain some closure. Kane's Jawbone Solution. So this is technically cheating. Kane's Jawbone is a puzzle and actually a very good one at that. So good in fact that only three people have solved it. So this is kind of cheating. It's not unsolved, but only three people have ever solved it, two of which are dead. So there is only one person on this earth that knows the answer and he has not ever released it. So I'm going to say that to the general public, this is unsolved. As I said, this puzzle has been solved by three people in a hundred years and has over 32 
2 million combinations. It asked the participant to perfectly reorder the books 100 pages and solve the murders within. Now, without knowing where every page is meant to be, if you were to try and randomly put 100 pages in a row correctly, the figure, the chance that you would get it right, has 158 digits just randomly. It's almost like a deck of cards, except instead of 52, it's 100. It is a number beyond our comprehension. It was solved by a couple in the 1930s who each won £25 for solving it. Only 25 And after the couple did, they eventually died, and people thought that the solution was lost forever, until British comedy writer John Finnamore spent four months trying to crack it and eventually succeeded. The only thing is, this has never been released to the public, so Kane's Jawbone, the solution to the puzzle, will be a mystery for the rest of us, probably for a long time, if not forever. The Awful. So we have another cryptid in here. This thing is meant to be some sort of griffin-like creature, first spotted in 1925 in Vermont, and by 1928 all sightings stopped. I wonder if it was fake. There were rumours that HP Lovecraft went up to Vermont to try and find it, but that's really the be-all and end-all about this creature. There's not too too much about it. It was there in 1925, it was gone by 1928. Let's move on. The 1972 Grand Canyon Stranger is strange. This stranger is strange. Provided this story is true, back in 1972, the original poster's uncle and his friends were up on the Grand Canyon. They took a picture and never saw this man in the black hood who was behind them. They did not notice this despite the fact that it appears from the picture that he's right behind them. So who was this bloke and why was he dressed like that? Especially on the Grand Canyon, that is not suitable attire you wouldn't think. Why didn't he make his presence known and why is he so much larger than the uncle? He might be very very tall or he could be maybe a bit closer to the camera, it's kind of hard to tell. This is a strange story, the stranger story is strange and there's something just a bit off about it. Of course there could be a simple answer but there is something just a little bit off about this picture. Uh, of course the uncle survived, all the friends were there but it is a bit of a weird picture that one. The Cooper family photo, definitely one of the creepier entries we've had so far. Long story short, this is a family who have taken a picture with what appears to be a dead body or an alien or maybe a ghost hanging from the ceiling, but just because this looks creepy doesn't actually mean that it is. This photo has to be cropped, otherwise it's very likely that it is staged. There has not been a cropped version found online and apparently this dates back to the 1950s. Here's the thing though, take a look at the picture again. Unless they really want to get their table in the picture, the chances are the photograph is a hoax or whoever's taking the photograph is horrible with a camera. Half the screen is taken up by just the table, right? Doesn't make any sense. A very good hoax considering it's 70 years old, but a hoax nonetheless. Lagima Sidi, if I am pronouncing that correctly, is one of the eight yogic powers of the Ashta Siddhis. It is mentioned in the Vyasa Bhasya on Yoga Sutra of Pantanjali. And to my uninformed Western understanding, I believe that the Lagima CD is theorized to be possible only to those who have mastered yoga. To do so, they must master the five elements, air, earth, fire, water, and space. Kind of like Last Airbender style with a little cherry on top. And according to legend, they can then feel true weightlessness. Please, to all the yogis out there, update me on your quest to master all of the elements, defeat the Fire Nation, and feel true weightlessness. Life inside black holes, that is our next entry today. So for as many answers as we have about black holes, we have so many more questions, right? These things are mental, and I don't understand them at all. I'm sure someone that knew a bit more about science would be better handling this question, but I'm just gonna tell you what I found online. So one of the biggest questions we have for black holes is, is there any life inside? I believe that they say that if you were to be sucked up by a black hole, you would be completely crushed, but nobody's ever been sucked up by a black hole. Not yet. And these things, they seem to me like anomalies of nature, or at least space. They are truly weird. I have no idea what a black hole is. <laughs> but before you dismiss the theory that something could be alive inside a black hole, in 2011, Vyacheslav Ivanovich Dokachev wrote a paper for Cornell University in which he detailed that there is space for life inside supermassive black holes. He claimed that the interiors of supermassive black holes may be inhabited by civilizations being invisible from the outside and that in principle one can get information from the interiors of black holes by observing their white hole counterparts. I don't know what that means but you know there might be life inside of black holes. I wouldn't think so but 
stranger things have happened, right? This stuff is way too advanced for me, so I'm going to move on to something I'm a little bit more comfortable with, and that is the mystery of the Hochelaga. So the story goes as followed. In 1535, French explorer Jacques Cartier and his crew became the first Europeans to set foot on the island of Montreal. They found a village there of well over a thousand people who were anxious to greet the newcomers. He wrote a description of what he saw, describing their community, outlining that they had 50 houses made of wood, he detailed their locations, but when Cartier returned to the village in 1541, only six years later, he found no trace of it. In fact, since the initial meeting, no one has ever found any evidence of the Hochelagan people. Was Cartier just imagining them? Or was he lying? His crew were there too though, so you'd think that if he did lie, they would have to have known about it and probably would have leaked the truth. If we pretend that they did exist for a moment, to eliminate a thousand people from Earth with no trace is near impossible. The existence of the Hochelagan people might forever be a mystery, at least it would be something that only Cartier and his crew would know. The evolutionary basis of the uncanny valley effect. So this one is probably complete BS, even the person that kind of created this tweet claims it is, but it is a very interesting thing to think about. So just a quick catch up if you don't know what the uncanny valley effect is, it is the idea that the more human something looks, the more creepy it is, right? So if you have a little tin toy robot that's waltzing about, we don't find that scary whatsoever, but super advanced AI might be a different story. A child's clay sculpture of humans, for example, not scary, but a professionally made one might be a little bit more to some people. So in December 2020, David Zemansky posted on Twitter, one of the most frightening things I've ever heard is when someone pointed out that the existence of the uncanny valley implies that at some point there was an evolutionary reason to be afraid of something that looked human, but wasn't. Now, obviously there might be more simple or logical explanations than assuming that at some point there was a humanoid creature, cryptid, or some sort of species that seemed human but wasn't in our past, but the point still stands that fear tends to be evolutionary for us. I've made so many videos in the past about fear and phobias, which you can watch, but for the most part, fear is kind of instilled in our DNA. Sometimes people will have very traumatic experiences, and of course, that will cause someone to be afraid of something. But a lot of the things, you know, spiders, drowning snakes, I mean, a lot of the common stuff would have some sort of reason for us to be afraid of them. The same might be said for the uncanny valley. It's something that is generally instilled in us. We don't tend to have any specific reason to be afraid of the unhuman, but we are, so why is that? Come to your own conclusions, I can't tell you. So next up is Frederick Bourdine, who I actually covered a month or two ago, very, very recently. So instead of me having to explain it for the next two or three minutes, I'm actually just going to skip ahead and cheat. And I'm going to use the clip that I spoke about last time because I put full faith in it that it will explain the story better than I can now. So here it is. Nicholas Barkley was 13 years old when he went missing in his San Antonio neighborhood. He was a troubled child. And while at first his disappearance was attributed to him running away, after a day when he he didn't come home, the police were contacted. He was last seen playing basketball with his friends, but with no car, no credit card, and nothing really to trace. The trail, therefore, soon ended. This should have been, for the most part, where the story concluded, but there was a shocking twist of fate soon to come. This twist of fate occurred three years later, when in a small Spanish village, Nicholas Barkley had been found alive. His sister went to pick him up and flew across the Atlantic to be returned to his family. However, something was off with the teenager. His hair was a different colour, and so was his eyes. He claimed to have been trafficked, and that his abductors dyed his hair and coloured his eyes so he wouldn't be identifiable, and that he had eventually escaped them, being a much different person to who he was before. The private investigator who worked closely with the Barclays noticed many oddities in Nicholas's story. He seemed more mature than traumatised, and the private investigator thought that the abductors would not dye a child's hair. And that's when he noticed the teen's ears were different to what they were a few years ago, not to mention the fact that it's near impossible to change a person's eye colour permanently. As it turns out, this man was an imposter, and in the excitement of getting their young child back, the Barclays had not noticed subtle clues right in front of them. This boy was actually 23-year-old Frederick Pierre Bourdin, known as the Chameleon due to the over 500 personas he had adopted in his life. This wasn't the first time that he had posed as a missing child either, he actually did it three times in his life. 
He was eventually arrested for six years after being found out, but blamed the Barclay family, saying that they knew more than they were letting on. He thought that they had killed Nicholas. The private investigator from before, the one that discovered Bodian's identity, allegedly believed that he was onto something. But to this day, we still have no confirmation on anything that happened back in June 1994. Very creepy stuff. The fact that he would actually go and have the balls to try and, you know, pretend that he's someone's lost child is evil. It's quite despicable. So this one is creepy. Rosalia Lombardo is the next person whose mystery I want to talk about. She's known as the child mummy who can open her eyes on the account that she can open her eyes. So this child died in 1920 of pneumonia, and her father was so grief-stricken that he wanted to preserve his daughter the best he could. The embalmer mummified her so perfectly that her vital organs are still intact over a hundred years later. She's kept in the Palmero catacombs with over 8,000 other corpses, but interestingly enough, it's said that she opens and closes her eyes slowly multiple times throughout the day, revealing her blue eyes. Some say that this is an optical illusion, others think that this is something to do with changes of air pressure. Some people even think that something might be going on a little bit more supernatural. Could she be trying to tell us something or is there a perfectly normal and rational explanation to this story? I don't know, but to be honest, I don't think we should care. We should just let this little girl rest in peace, even if her story is extremely enticing. The Giant Finger. So back in my Historical Mysteries Iceberg Explain video, I kind of crapped on the idea that giants could have existed. And I did feel a bit of backlash from me going very harsh on the idea that they didn't. And I might have to eat my hat here because apparently they have found a giant finger. I don't know the validity of this. I don't know how reliable it is, but there are some pictures online of this giant finger. Back in 2012, a 15 inch finger was reported on by a German news outlet or at least we hope it was a finger. The supposed finger was originally seen by explorer Gregor Spordy in 1988, and researchers believe that it would have belonged to a creature over five meters tall. He returned in 2012, but when all of the evidence of it was gone, he released his story as well as pictures of it he had taken 24 years prior to help prove its existence. If this is a hoax, it has not been yet debunked, and it has left us with one massive question, where is the finger now? Also, why would someone want to hide it from the world? If it does exist, does that mean that at some point there were giants roaming around Egypt? Could it have just been a very isolated incident, just one man with extreme, extreme giantism? These are all questions with no answers for now, so I'm sorry I cannot provide you with any concrete evidence or answers. We're gonna have to make do with nothing. The French horse killing ritual. Shout out to all of the people that watch my videos in France. Unless you're a horse killer, in which case, fuck you. So this is a real thing, I kid you not. A bunch of reputable news sources have reported that especially in the past two years, there have been an abnormal amount of horse mutilations in France. Now, the normal amount is zero, but in 2020, French countrysides had 15. Police thought that this could be a internet challenge or maybe a satanic ritual, but the evidence shocked everyone. Firstly, these attacks happened all over the country, not just in surrounding areas. Secondly, it seems as though whoever was doing the attacks, they had a knowledge of horse anatomy and they would murder them brutally based on their knowledge. There was always a modus operandi, otherwise known as pattern, which was that the right ear was always cut off almost in a surgical manner. Additionally, there was this weird symbol which lacks context. To my knowledge, this mystery is still unsolved, even if a few people have been arrested, charged with links to the rituals. I mean, awful, awful, disgusting, disturbing uh, killings here. For them to do all of them would be very tough also. So. This mystery still has no answer. Artificial Martian moons. Take a look at the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. These moons are regular in shape, but since their discovery, some people have theorized that they're fake or not moons or that they are hollow. I guess this is technically unsolved because we haven't gone to either Phobos or Deimos, but to be honest, I kind of feel like it uh, kind of is solved. Again, I really don't want to delve into wacko conspiracy theories about outer space. The tale of Ma the tale of Mademoiselle Sage is a very, very interesting one that I am excited to bring you. Her existence was first detailed in Robert Dale Owen's book, The Footfalls on the Boundaries of Another World, originally published in 1860, and the legend goes as followed. Apparently, Owen had spoken to a woman by the name of Mademoiselle 
de Guldenstuber, who told him the story of a teacher that she had back in her Livonian school when she was younger. In 1845, she swore that she kept seeing her then teacher, Mademoiselle Asagi, all over the school in places that she could not have been. One moment, the kids at school would see her on one end, and then students at the same time at the other end of the school would see her there too. Did she have a twin that she didn't tell anyone about? Well, the teachers kept on saying that these kids were letting their imaginations get the best of them. But one day, something would happen to throw all of this out of the window. Sage was teaching a class to 13 students, including Guldenstube. When suddenly, while she was writing on the chalkboard, there were two of her standing there. Mademoiselle Sage had a double in every way. This double was reflecting her every move, almost as if someone had a mirror placed between them. Only difference was that the double had no chalk and wasn't writing on the board, despite replicating her actions in real time. This spectre was seen a few more times, once in a mirror's reflection, but never by any of the teachers. What was the source of this paranormal activity? Were there any fibs along the way? It's never been verified, and here we are 200 years later, neither being able to confirm nor deny that it ever happened. The Galician Fisherman UFO Sighting For such a clear video, I'm surprised that this doesn't actually have more views. But the story of this one was that there was a group of Galician fishermen who were out in the middle of nowhere, when two jets flew past them, followed by a UFO which dived into the water, and finally they were chased up by a helicopter. This is the most clear UFO sighting I've ever seen, usually they're about 3 pixels, but with this quality also comes the chance to debunk it. I don't know nearly enough about water physics or even video manipulation to tell you how they might have fixed this, if it is uh, fixed whatsoever. I'm sure if it was more famous then it would have been confirmed or denied by now. But there it is, if you're into UFO sightings there is a very clear, quite recent one for you to look at. Personally I believe in aliens, I don't think they've been to Earth, but that's just my two cents. Mooncube. So this is a very recent story dropping in December of last year, but apparently this two pixel thing is a cube on the moon, and then China's rover went over to check it out. When this iceberg was created I don't think that uh, I guess it had been solved yet, but since it actually has. We think that this was a piece of debris, it was either a comet or an asteroid that hit the moon and it created this cube thing. Shouldn't be anything to worry about. Camera heads. So this is actually a very fun creepypasta or cryptid, I guess. Um, so the concept is that there are some people walking around among us that are not people, I guess, technically. They are, but they have cameras in their eyes, they're always recording your best friend or I don't know even your mum could be working for the government or maybe the Illuminati and you just wouldn't know they have I guess recording devices in their eyes at all times. The idea of camera heads came around the same time as Jeff the Killer and Slenderman so you don't need to worry too much probably I believe that this is uh, fake but I mean how could we confirm it for real? That was weird. Unless they are real and then someone leaked their existence around the same time that these other very famous creepypastas came out. The smell of sulfur phenomena is something that I haven't actually thought of before, but it does happen a lot. The concept is that according to multiple sources, sources that are not linked, they occur all over the place, people who claim they've encountered the devil or demonic forces all claim that he smells of sulfur. The same thing can often be said for Bigfoot or UFOs. Basically, if you encounter something that you shouldn't have, the chances are it smells of sulfur. So why is this? So why have the masses declared that the devil or Bigfoot or UFOs or aliens smell like sulfur? I don't know. This is a trope that's been around for hundreds of years and of course you wouldn't expect Bigfoot or the devil to smell like roses or rose petals but I don't know, sulfur, very distinct and it happens a lot. A lot of people say that they have met the devil and he smells of that so this mass lie, where do we all get it from? Was it just that we heard that's what he smells like so if we're going to lie then we use that in our lie? I, I really don't know. Watching the Watchers so out California way there is a house called the Eucapia house and legend has it that the residents of this boarded up house just sit there all day every day watching passers by. If someone stops outside their house even if it is just for a moment they will run out screaming and yelling and uh, you know they're always watching for some reason right. The reason why they watch all the time varies from person to person if you ask them about them. And there have been many assumptions or false rumours made up about the family, but there are several videos of people up on YouTube where they go to the houses to try and find them, and they really do just watch from their house all the time. 
They're always there waiting to get you off of their property. I understand that a lot of people came to harass them a few years ago. Obviously, you should not do that. But I also think that the watchers have kind of become their own worst enemies because people wouldn't go if you didn't shout at them to get off your land all the time every time someone stops outside your house. Why they do it though is still an unsolved mystery. And the final thing we have today is Patterson Road, Texas. This is a haunted road in which the ghosts that haunt it usually will use all five human senses to let their presence be known. Brave souls wishing to call on the spirits will simply stop their car on Langham Creek Bridge, turn off the headlights and wait. Allegedly, countless visitors have reported hearing sounds like knuckles repeatedly striking the vehicle, almost as if to warn the passengers of impending danger. If you're in the Houston area, Texas, and you are into ghost hunting, why not give it a little check out? This would be a great spot that you might not have heard of before. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for watching this video. This is only the first part of this series. There are so many more entries I didn't get to, each more obscure than the last. If you did enjoy, please whack that big red button. You've watched this for an hour, so please, you have to, you have to subscribe if you've made it to the end. I have a Twitter and an Instagram that you could follow. I have a Discord that you can join, as I said earlier. All the links are in the description. I also have a Patreon. Shout out to my patrons. You can see them up on screen right now. You guys are the best. Thank you so, so much for supporting me. Real talk, 100 videos is such a mountain to climb, and I'm so happy that we're finally here. I mean, it is a great, great feeling. I just want to thank everyone for supporting me. So here's to 100 more. As I said, this might be a series, so if you enjoyed, do like this video and I will be more inclined to make future episodes. We're only actually about 15% of the way through the iceberg, so we have so much more stuff still to cover. With that said and that out of the way, please let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see me do next because I'm only 100 videos in and I'm already out of ideas. Thank you for watching.